<coughs> we come now to the 35th and final study of our camp here in British Columbia in 1984. After this, of course, we'll have the Lord's Supper and um, then uh, just a closing Sabbath worship at sundown tonight. Did I say 35 or 34? 35, right, 35th study. This is the 3 o'clock study on Sabbath afternoon, the 1st of September. Before I plunge more directly into the how of bringing about the conversion of children, I'd like to make a couple of observations arising from conversations held during the lunch hour period. One person made the remark that his first reaction was that this presented before us a terrible standard to attain or to reach out after. But in reality, we are not to make the standard to be the target Rather, our business is to establish the causes and let those effects take care of themselves. <coughs> and remind you again in the statement on page 661 of the book Desire of Ages, one of my very real favourite statements, page 661 in the book Desire of Ages, at the end of the chapter dealing with the uh, Lord's Supper. And here it says that he who beholds the Saviour's matchless love will be elevated in thought purified in heart and transformed in character. Which means, of course, that uh, if we establish certain causes, then the effects will take care of themselves. And our task is to behold the Saviour's master's love. If we do that, the rest will follow in its due time. We will be elevated in thought, we will be purified in heart, and we will be transformed in character. And you find that these consequences will accrue as a natural outworking of, the, of our doing what God here directs us to do. And if I wish to develop this thought more adequately, I could turn back to John the Baptist's training and read such wonderful uh, principles there revealed in his life as well. But I'll just give you the page number at least and um, then we can um, say in more detail again some other time. But in respect to John the Baptist, the Word of God says in page 103, Desire of Ages, he looked upon the king and his beauty and self was forgotten. He beheld the majesty of holiness and felt himself to be inefficient and unworthy. He was ready to go forth as heaven's messenger, unawed by the human because he had looked upon the divine. He could stand erect and fear less in the presence of earthly monarchs because he had bowed low before the king of kings. And here's a series of established causes followed by equally certain results. He looked upon the king and his beauty, that's the cause, the result and self was forgotten. Now the cause again, he beheld the majesty of holiness and the result was he felt himself to be inefficient and unworthy. Result is mentioned first next time, he was ready to go forth as heaven's messenger, unawed by the human, there's the effect of the result, now the cause, because he had looked upon the divine. And the same principle holds good in the matter of raising children. It is not our business to rein ourselves up to some tremendous standard. Our task is to establish the causes and leave the effects to take care of themselves. And you can be absolutely certain that if you do establish the causes, namely a true new birth experience for the children, and secondly, an adequate training day by day, the results will come in their own good time. And you'll be very gratified by those results too as the days become weeks and the weeks become years. Another thought uh, that arose in this conversation was that um, we have to face the fact that our previous efforts to bring up our children in the way of God have not been very successful. So that um, obviously some other way is called for. If our minds go back to the days before this message came, that is the actual message of bondage to freedom, way back 20 and 25 years ago and in the case of many of you of course uh, since then or earlier than that uh, later than that period of, point of time we have to recognise that the way we sought salvation in the Seventh day Adventist Church before the message of Waver and Jones arrived did not work and as certainly as it did not work we needed something better and God gave us something better in like manner we have to recognise too that the way in which we have been bringing up our children has not been working as is evidenced by the number of them which leave us at the age of 15, 16 and 17 and go out to live a very unthinking, 
a thoughtless worldly life of sin and abandonment of the Christian principles. So therefore the very fact that the old message hasn't worked calls for a new one and this new one of course must not be a human solution, it must be a gospel presentation, a gospel procedure it must be a plan formed in the mind of God a plan in which there is not one single thread of human devising. Now, I'd like to stress the point that it must be a gospel presentation and uh, <clears throat> it, a careful examination will demonstrate that this message on child salvation is nothing more or less than the application of the gospel we have been teaching for all these years which has made this movement to be what it is. It's not something new or different. It's simply the same gospel meeting the same kind of need in a different uh, age level of people. That's all that there is to it. And like I said, all in five, five or six words, I can simply say, apply the, apply the gospel to your children and you've got the answer. If you know the gospel, then of course you can apply it. So it's not, it's not a different message or a new message. In other words, in this movie we apply the gospel to the sin problem, the gospel to the health problem, and the gospel to the child's salvation problem in all three spheres. And the consequences, of course, we do thereby enjoy deliverance from these singular problems. Let's now um, look into the uh, practical procedures whereby parents can be guaranteed that they will achieve salvation for their children, much happier homes and undivided families in the glorious home made new. It all begins, of course, with marriage. The, what we're talking about is the establishment of a divine kingdom upon this earth in which father and mother are kings under the king of kings who is Jesus Christ and the children are subjects of this empire. The total membership might only be four people or three people, two parents and one child or maybe it might be, might be three children, four children, five children, whatever it may be. But however large or small, this is a kingdom. And of course, unless it is a divine kingdom, it will not reflect the image of God or reveal his principles of operation or be a successful kingdom. Daniel 2 demonstrates that kingdom is built after human procedures and principles pass away. And if you want to face the passing away, the dissolution of your kingdom, which means your subject all, subjects all abandon you, then build your kingdom after the ways of the world with instruments of coercion. If on the other hand we wish to build a divine kingdom, from which every weapon of coercion is banished then we can be assured it will not pass away but will grow to be a great mountain which fills the entire world. So then the basis or the successful uh, basis yes for the bringing of children up in the way of God is to have a home which is truly a divine kingdom which of course means that father and mother must be one. <coughs> In heaven, of course, there are three. There's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are what? One. Here we have a, a unity which is so perfect and so absolute that there's not the slightest flaw or crack in that beautiful union between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if the heavenly, if the heavenly kingdom in heaven requires that kind of unity between the leaders of the heavenly kingdom, then what must the heaven, heavenly kingdom on earth require? the same unity, right? They must have the same unity. Now in this unity there is a structure and that structure is laid out for us very clearly in Ephesians the fifth chapter. I don't have time to read all these verses today because this, this has to be a very tight little presentation to cover as much ground as possible in one study period which will be all too short for a talkative person like me. <laughs> but in Ephesians the fifth chapter husbands are to love their wives and to be head of the home and what's the very next word in that text as Christ is head of the church and I believe the word as appears at least four, five, maybe six or seven times in the fifth chapter of Ephesians where Paul again and again puts that word in to provide the comparison between the heavenly kingdom above and its organizational structure and the earthly kingdom below and its organizational structure in turn now Jesus Christ is head of the church in a certain wonderful and very specific manner. He could be head as the papacy is the head over men. He could be head as dictators and kings rule over men but he's not head as men are head. He's not head as some husbands are heads of their wives by being forceful and dictatorial and dogmatic and despotic and so forth. 
So a husband makes all the decisions and has his own way and the rest just drag along behind him. That's not the kind of headship we're talking about here. But rather it's the headship of a supportive, leading person who binds the family together. The word husband, of course, coming from the old English house band or house binder. That, that is his particular role and position. Now very obviously for man to understand his role very precisely he must study the model. And who is the model? Jesus Christ. And consequently that man who spends most time under God's spiritual leadership studying Christ's position as the head of the church and learns how Christ occupies that position and operates in that position, learns Christ's ways, Christ's procedures and, gain, and, and obtains Christ's spirit and disposition, that is the kind of man alone who makes a good husband. Alone. Nobody else can. And the better the, the husband, perspective or, 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 or already so in actual fact, the better he understands these great principles, the more successfully he will be the head of the house, the more successfully he will occupy that position and the more successfully he will, with his, together with his wife, bring up his children. Now in turn, the wife is to be submissive to her husband, to obey her husband as, again, the believer obeys Jesus Christ. Therefore, the better both the husband and the wife understand their individual relationship to Jesus Christ, by study and prayer and meditation upon their great and wonderful life, the more effectively they can establish upon this earth a heavenly kingdom which is a duplicate, a perfect duplicate of the heavenly kingdom above. And remember Daniel 2 is the picture of a successful versus a very unsuccessful kingdom or series of kingdoms. And uh, parents would do well of course to spend more time looking at that great chapter because in Daniel 2 we have a success in the world attempts to build a, an enduring satisfying, productive world empire. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome in turn tried it. In these last days of course we have all kinds of attempts and with dictatorships and monarchies and democracies and so forth to build satisfactory world empires and history demonstrates that that kind of kingdom structure doesn't bring an enduring and permanent solution to man's problems. But when Jesus Christ comes with his kingdom structure which cannot be compared to earthly kingdoms as we read in Acts the Apostles, page 12, he builds a kingdom which not only destroys the earthly ki kingdom but rules throughout all eternity, a permanent, enduring and indestructible kingdom type and made so, of course, by his, by his very structure. So then the first step in um, successfully bringing children up in the way of the Lord is for father and mother to establish a true heavenly kingdom structure in their homes. Now that may take a lot of study, a lot of prayer, a lot of um, confession of sin and a great deal of personal transformation before the qualifications are achieved by the parents concerned. But let me emphasize the point that no parents who do, do, who do not achieve this unity of spirit and so forth will ever be successful in bringing their children up in the way of the Lord. When one reflects upon this fact, of course, we, we readily understand why Satan is so bent on driving wedges between fathers and mothers. And he's all too successful, is he not? Absolutely all too successful. Needless to say, those who are contemplating marriage should be extremely careful to choose, to choose a person who is, who is not an unbeliever. Because if a person is an unbeliever, then he, is, he or she is totally unqualified or disqualified from being a successful parent. Now those um, marriage partners who married of course outside of the truth who didn't understand this great message and, and uh, then later accepted the mission and find themselves divided from their partners got of course the special provisions for those unfortunate situations and, and intercessory prayer and strong faith can work wonders these, under these conditions. Now when the parents have achieved this understanding of the kingdom of God and have through much prayer and, and thorough consecration and confession of sin established that kind of kingdom and are working to, to consolidate it day by day which of course includes their having gained for themselves a true new birth experience because remember 
unless a man is born again, he can't even see the kingdom, let, let alone do one. Right? Except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, let alone build the kingdom of God. That's, that's, that's an impossibility. And when the time comes that, and of course all this should be, I mean most of this should be attended to before the actual marriage has taken place, so, so the knowledge is there, and when marriage does take place, it can be implemented in the, in the establishment of a true Christian home. Now once the parents have married and they've planned under God's personal choosing direction to have their first child, and of course it would be best if the child was actually planned rather than, rather than happen, as sometimes is the case, although in the end result is still, the procedure is still the same, then the moment that the parents know that the conception has taken place, together, and let me stress this with all my heart and soul, together a united king and queen must kneel down together and confess before God the presence in their as yet unborn infant of the spirit of disobedience, which is the old carnal mind, which is the seed of Satan, which is the old man of sin, which is the stony heart, which is any one of many more names you might like to call it. And of course, above all else, it's a disease, it's a presence, it's a life force, it's a spirit, it is the indwelling presence and power of sin. And uh, I should have mentioned the point too, of course, that uh, I, I must go back and mention this point, that when the parents are contemplating a conception, they should then make a special work of um, seeking God in prayer, building up a very strong faith experience, reading and treasuring the great promises of God so, so their faith is absolutely undimmed and strong so when they come before God and seek righteousness by faith for the little one, the little one will share in that faith experience will be able to, and be able to lay hold on its behalf of the living experience of the new birth in his, in his, in his life and, and present in, in, his, in his body. Now, when this confession is made, then there must come the surrender of the old nature and please don't pray, Lord, we ask you to take it away. That, that works, I suppose. It's much more positive to say, Lord, here it is, I give it to you, it is now yours, you take it. That is much more positive and much more successful, I found, in uh, both of my own experience and, in, in, and the experience of others. And having given the Lord your little one, your tiny, unborn, infant's evil, carnal spirit of disobedience, now there's a vacuum. There's an empty space where that evil thing was. And into that space you must now lay hold upon and receive on behalf of your unborn infant the new life which uh, takes the place of the old life. Now this is the parent's first and most pressing responsibility. And you recognise that there is a first and pressing responsibility which has not even been considered as a responsibility in the past. Parents haven't even thought about the idea of ensuring that they give the child the right beginning in life by making certain it has been delivered from the old spirit of disobedience. When before the last 18 months, for instance, have we, or the last 12 months, for instance, have we ever heard, either in the Adventist Church or in this movie or anywhere else in the world, a message which makes that the first and most pressing need that must be attended to? But we just haven't heard it, have we? And the time has now come, of course, when there must be a reversal of this loss of, of the precious lives of our very beautiful and lovely children. Having, having then achieved this first, this first, this primary objective, this very pressing need in the life, then begins the great work of reformation. Well, it's not so much reformation for the child as formation. Now, we, of course, have spent uh, 10, 15, 20, 30, even 40 years, 50 years or more. Some of us don't hear the message until we're quite old. Those, those of us who spend many years out there in the school of Satan have been formed after his image. And what do we need? Reforming, which is otherwise called reformation. Okay? And any of you parents, of course, who since last year have begun to apply these principles to children already growing up, six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds and so forth, will find that even though there's good evidence to, to demonstrate that the child has been born again, that the habit patterns established during the years up until that point, with their one year or five years or ten years, the case might be, <laughs> do require a process of reformation or reformation. Old habits will strive for the mastery. Old habits of thought will uh, continually seek to dominate. 
and just as in the adult reformation experience that so the little ones likewise must um, be reformed into the divine image and it takes some time but not so long of course it takes, was, it takes for us to spend more years in Satan's camp the longer the period of time which has elapsed between when the message when the child is conceived and the message comes the, the more difficult the reformation period becomes now Jesus Christ himself did not require a reformation he required a formation a moulding a fastening and so forth and I'm apt to believe that um, every, one of our, every one of our infants or children who are reformed be pardon, who are reborn from the time of their conception and um, the mother and father of course diligent, diligently work in the process of forming them in, after God's own image that those children will not have bad habits to unlearn what a wonderful start they have another point mentioned to me during the lunch hour is this that um, Jesus Christ we are told had no advantage over us but uh, it seems so when we realize that he was born of God from his very conception and therefore never learned any bad habits or practices if he had of course to become a sinner and would have ceased to be our saviour but, th but now we recognize of course that um, while some of us may be disadvantaged because of our late start we're simply further down the road of course but in the case of those children who like Jesus Christ are possess the divine nature from their very conception there is um, uh, there's no advantage between one and the other whatsoever <clears throat> right and come back to come back now to this training work we'll deal with the idea of situation first namely where the parents plan this whole thing from the evening before they're married now once the conception has taken place the training begins the education begins the formation begins the molding the fastening the shaping of that little life begins and without question our present knowledge tells us and there's more and more evidence all the time to underline this point that the education received during those first nine months of a child's life are the most significant, the most formative that he'll ever receive and afterwards the, the most difficult to counteract and of course the original shapes are always the most enduring in any life pattern I'm sure it is therefore essential that during the first nine months period the mother and the fa fa father make or uh, take the utmost advantage of the opportunities granted to them now after the nine months are over the child is actually born becomes a separate entity a, 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 a an individual living in its own body separate from the mother's body and therefore now and and there is lost that absolute oneness of uh, movement that the mother and child had before the child was born so it's, it's vast God has been very kind to us in that um, he has provided the easiest possible educational uh, procedures before the child is born or during the period when it is most important because all the mother has to do and the father with her is to ensure that during those nine months those nine months they live as they want their life their child to later live that's all they have to do now for instance let me put it this way to you as I said last night I think it was that every single experience the mother and father pass through the mother in particular of course uh, and the father is very important in that he um, uh, influences and shares with the mother the life of their living and therefore his life is her life as well so it's both father and mother involved now the point is that every experience that the, that the parents pass through during those nine months the child lives those experiences as if they were his very own no question about that and the child forms judgments and reasons and draws conclusions and his mind and disposition are being shaped by what it is going through during that period of time now don't confuse us with heredity obviously of course heredity is something we can't change in, in, in the physical characteristics of blue eyes or brown eyes blonde hair or red hair black hair or brown hair as the case may be the potential for, for, for height growth and uh, facial features and what none of that we can touch or change anyway at all that is that is a fixed hereditary transmission but what you certainly can very definitely influence is the um, the disposition the character the nature which you possess uh, during those, th th that period and what you feed upon 
mentally speaking, what you think about, what you say, your tempers, dispositions and whatnot. I'm just trying to think what I read the other day, um, a statement, I just kind of lost memory where, where, where it was now that uh, in, connection, in connection with someone's life and the spirit of prophecy, where Sister White talked about that very point. I think some patriarchs and prophets, I just lost, it'll come back to me in a moment, I'm sure. I'd like to read it again at this point. So therefore, during that, those nine months, then the, the parents should establish a pattern of behaviour, a relationship to each other, a response to life situations, which would be the perfect pattern for what they, what they want their child to be like when it, when it comes into the world. Now, let's put it this way. What is the most important lesson that we have to learn? The lesson of holiness, which is implicit, unquestioning obedience and living faith in the giver of the orders which we're obeying. It is not ours as God's children the reason why. It's ours but to do and die if necessary. Now if that's the most important lesson we as adults have to learn to see the work successfully through to its conclusion, then what is the most important lesson for infants to learn? That same lesson. Is it being learned by the vast majority of children today? This is a prevailing age of disobedience to parents as foretold in the book of Timothy. It's regarded as one of the significant uh, sins of these last days when children are disobedient to parents. Now, supposing then that the mother and father realise this and the mother and father realise correctly that, that how they behave during that nine months period is the way the baby is going to behave and if during that nine months period the mother renders to the father that submissive obedience of a true child of God to him in other words, if she obeys her husband as she in turn obeys Jesus Christ if during that period he is the head of the house in the true sense of that word as Christ is head of the church then what is that child receiving for nine months before it's born? An unbeatable less than obedience isn't it? The very, the very shape of his mind his whole disposition and attitude is, is being trained in continual ob ob obedience it knows nothing else during that time but that what, a, what an opportunity we've lost when you think about it I mean, when those of us parents who look back and think about children now grown up and gone out with their own partners to have children of their own when you become a grandfather like me of course <laughs> then you really think of the lost opportunities that are now gone because this thing is cumulative if for instance uh, I had known these things way back 35 years ago before my children were first born or a little longer than that perhaps and had um, very very carefully prepared myself for marriage and put these principles into practice so that my children had grown up with the very spirit of obedience built into them and trained into them so the nine months training before they were born was a confirmation of what was in them by virtue of their being born again if there had been a very lovely experience of parental bonding as there would have been with the children if every year their lives had been, an, had been an ongoing experience in obedience and they in turn having learnt these wonderful truths had um, continued the practice in their children so that my grandchildren would be like my children had been what, what tremendous children would be, would be coming up in the world as, as this, this ongoing influence began to accumulate in force and power and you imagine a church today with, with, shall we say, a thousand children, every one of whom had been brought in the world the right way, what a, what a power they'd be, spiritually, mentally and physically. If Jesus Christ himself alone turned history round about face, what would a thousand such children do when they became adults in this old world of sin? So we certainly have missed a, a fantastic opportunity and I envy with all my heart those young couples today who plan to get married, who are dedicated to these same principles, who are determined to learn them and have this marvellous opportunity right there within their grasp. As well as um, this less than obedience to your nose dimas, the mother and father can determine the tastes of their children, what, what the children will, will like and enjoy later on. Now one thing which really impressed me in the study of the, of the life of Jesus Christ as a baby and as a child and as a youth was his tastes. Now what did he love? He loved the word of God with all his heart. That's what he just fed upon. He loved to read it. And uh, he had no taste 
for the works of fiction and whatever else might have been available back in those days. And I imagine, of course, that there were uh, itinerant uh, storytellers who told their silly fables and fictitious stories. There were, there were plays, I think, being performed at least by the Romans. And no doubt the Jewish children peeped into the, to the palace stage to see what was going on. But Christ had no taste for that kind of thing. The same as today, I suppose that practically everyone in this room, maybe some of the young people might, but the older folk, I'm sure, have no taste for rock music. I certainly don't. I hate the, the, the detestable stuff. <laughs> now, there's no taste for it. And when it's being played, it irritates us, it bothers us, and we'd like to get away from it. It's like something unpleasant in your mouth. By the way, um, those of you who read that book, The Secret Life of the Unborn Child, will read that there's one thing which unborn infants absolutely hate is rock music. Absolutely hate it. In fact, they're so violently that one baby kick and thrash around when his baby went to a rock concert she, she had to leave because of she discovered she, that, that she experienced because of the baby's uh, protests against that kind of music and only when she was well away from that terrible sound he finally settled down but he surely let her know that he didn't like it and every test um, applied to um, expectant mothers in regard to rock music showed that without exception every child hated rock music with all their hearts and souls they learned to love it later on apparently now, so then, during that nine months period, the mother and father can definitely cultivate or produce a certain taste or like or dislike in the life of the unborn child. I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, one mother whom I know personally, who told me how that when she heard these tales, she said, well, that's interesting, she said, because uh, I have seven children, which she does, I know each one of them too, and she said that the fourth of my seven children was carried by me at a time when I wasn't uh, able to get around too well and I had lots of time on my hands. My husband was home. He was a farmer, spent most of the time helping and the other elder children was all, also carried their weight. And during that time, she read uh, exclusively from the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy. There was no television in the house, no radio in the house. Uh, it was well out in the country, far from the maddening crowds, ignoble strife and so on and uh, she spent that time reading by, the, by hours per day the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy. And she says of all her children, that particular one is different. Never once did she have to chastise that child. The child was naturally uh, cheerful, pleasant, cooperative and obedient all the days of her life. And never once did she have to be, be strapped. Now, now the girl is close to 30 years of age. So there, there's no question about the fact that we can create likes and dislikes in our children and of course produce in them a development of character and disposition before they're even born. When they are born of course, um, then the rapport between father and mother must continue, the kingdom of God must be established upon this earth and as children grow up in, within the environment of a heavenly kingdom and I can't overstress the need for this, always maintain a heavenly kingdom in your house and make sure the children qualify to be members of that kingdom. And then the training process goes forward in a well-ordered home because God's kingdom is a kingdom of order. Keep asking yourself, what happens in God's kingdom? Is it disorderly? No, it's not. Is it disarranged? No, it's untidy? No, it's not. Is everything on time? Yes, it is. And um, remember too that um, if ever you do find yourself in need to have a confrontation with a child, never enter into a confrontation that you can't win. Because a parent must never, I say again, must never lose a single battle with the children. Now, for instance, in the heavenly kingdom which, of which our homes are to be the, dup the duplicate, does God ever lose a battle with his children? Who wins in every contest? If there is a contest, God always does. Now, of course, uh, you might get your own way, as the Adventist Church did back in 1888, but you've lost the battle, haven't you? Just the same. And, uh, but in, in an earthly home, of course, the children must never have their own way. The parents must always be in command, and they must learn ways and means whereby this is achieved. Now, of course, in, in those children in whom the spirit of obedience is present, we find that um, when their problem, problem arises, they're going to be naturally cooperative and when you in, uh, uh, um, invite them to come with you and give God the problem, they will be found to be only too willing to do so. And before I go to find that direction now, let's begin to address ourselves to the not-so-ideal situation where children are already born. What now is going to be done? 
And we can divide uh, children already born into two groups. One, those who are between the ages of, shall we say, just born up to 14 or 15 or 16. And two, those who are older than that, and in many cases, of course, have become married themselves and have their own children, which are your grandchildren. Now, the only difference between um, bringing salvation to the freshly conceived child as yet unborn and the already born child is that you've lost some time. And two things have happened. One, the child has suffered um, intellectual and spiritual damage because of the indwelling presence of sin, the great destroyer. And two, a wrong education has already been uh, moulding and fastening that child's dispositions, attitudes, likes and dislikes. So now that you've got, not only got the task of implanting, or first of all you've got the task of stopping the erosion of mental and physical power and spiritual power, and you've also got the task of undoing the wrong education and implanting a right education in its place. So that the task there is more difficult and more complicated, but it can be done. And it's amazing how quickly, of course, they will learn bad habits and how slowly, of course, they'll learn good habits. Every parent knows that all too well. Now, we're going to suppose now that the child has come to the age where he is able to listen and learn and reason and make decisions, which I suppose in its very early stages is quite early in life, two and three and four years of age in a limited degree. And the parent then, when he, when he becomes aware of these principles as we are doing at the present time, must first of all recognise that in, even though in ignorance he has made some bad mistakes in the past, and therefore, even though it's been done ignorantly, it's now a known sin, he must come before God and make a very deep and searching confession and repentance of the mistakes already made. This, of course, is his very definite responsibility. And then, having made his peace with God, he then asks God to, to, to assist him now, to teach him and train him in the way of doing this work properly. When he feels that he has developed uh, a living faith sufficient to bring his children to Christ, then gather the children around you and both mother and father must be present. I have uh, received report after report from parents who tell me again and again that the work does not succeed if both parents are available and only one goes ahead to do it. A little different, of course, in the case of divided homes where if the unbelieving partner more or less hands over the responsibility of child education to the believing partner, then of course you don't have to have both parents present. But the mother or the father who is, who is on the right side will have to be a person of very powerful prayer, able to intercede mightily on behalf of their children if they wish to negate or count, counteract the unfortunate situation created by uh, a, a divided home. But let's talk about a united home, which um, is, of course, more, more is nearer to the ideal. Now, father and mother must then gather the children around them and confess to them, and that's hard to do, I know, but confess to them that they have been doing it the wrong way. This has not been a divine kingdom, it's been a satanic kingdom. And ask them the question to the children, are you satisfied, are you completely happy with the home government you've known so far? And they'll say, well, not, not really. Or well, no, we haven't. I'm sure they'll say that. Then tell them that you can now offer them, and you, you, you're offering, not forcing, you're offering them a kingdom in which there will be, there'll be no more punishments, no more weapons of coercion, a home which there'll be a complete bond of love between parents and children, a happy family. And ask them would they like to enjoy that kind of kingdom. And what do you suppose they'll say? They'd love to have that kind of kingdom. The, the mere thought, of course, of no longer being punished or whipped, the glorious freedom of this promises to them is enough in itself to make children enthusiastic about the idea. Now, <clears throat> I think I stressed this point on Friday evening. I understand very well that um, when any one of us is successful in winning a soul to Jesus Christ, there's a special bond is created between you and the person that you win to the gospel. That, that is always the case. And when a parent brings salvation to their children, then it is that a very special bond is established between father and mother on the one hand and child upon the other hand. 
And for this reason I will not teach the children the way of salvation. That is the parent's responsibility and I will not usurp that responsibility. I will teach the parents, the parents teach the children. Because between the parent and the child, not between me and the child, that bond should be established. <clears throat> so then the parents then offer this um, gift to the children. Oh, I'm going to say yes. While I will not bring salvation to the children, I have made it my business to ask children across the country, more particularly last year after I left here, to ask them, um, were they happy with the spirit of disobedience? And everyone said no, they're not. They didn't want to be that kind of child. And I asked them, would they like to have the spirit of obedience? They all said, yes, we would. And they were quite sincere about it. And they wanted it for the sake of being obedient itself, not just to be saved from punishment. And I appreciated their motive very much. Well, then you'll next tell the child that if they want to be members of that kind of king, they have to have the qualifications. And the qualifications are the new birth experience and that you will teach them how to obtain that deliverance. And then the father and the mother become literally a preacher of the gospel. It's your task to explain to them, take them outside of the thorn bush and explain how that in them the spirit of disobedience is the product of a seed, that seed came from Satan, Satan is their father, and that uh, the only solution is to root out the thorn bush, break up the family relationship with the devil, and put a good tree into its place. Then teach them the great promises of God where he says he'll do this and as their faith grows day by day the time comes when you're able to kneel down with them father and mother and children together and lead them in confession lead them to give away the old evil nature lead them to receive the new in its place. And then begins the work of reformation and don't be surprised of course if you find some bad lapses because old habits do strive for the mastery but consistently and faithfully continue on in the good work and you'll find that um, as you do so results will be seen and as I said before around the world today mothers and fathers are rejoicing in this new light they find the message is working the children are different they're, they're happy and uh, while there's still problems to be overcome mainly due to of course the fact that folk are still kind of feeling their way through this training part of the procedure success is being enjoyed I must say, of course, that I have much more confidence in your ability to bring about the new birth experience in your children than I have in the, the, the ability of most parents to train their children. That's a skill. And uh, it seems to me that very par few parents have the capacities to do so. But if you, if you recognize your incapacity, remember that Jesus Christ is your wisdom. And as you read in page 512, Desire of Asia, we are to bring our perplexities to Jesus Christ. Every time you find yourself up against a problem you don't have the answer for, give it to him and ask him for his wisdom and he will give it and you'll be surprised how you'll be directed and aided in the work of bringing up your children and to me this is the most wonderful theme that we've been preaching for years to me it's, it's, it's very exciting I'm extremely interested in mothers of the present time and fathers too of course and uh, I want to spend time with them counselling and guiding them as much as I possibly can so we shall have a wonderful army of beautiful converted well trained